wonderful speakers today from the wilds of North London to the expanse of Herefordshire, the far south of Exmouth and the farmyards of Oral in the Northwest. Each speaker is gonna tell us about their experiences working with councils for about 10 minutes. Uh, and they all have wonderful slideshows. These folks have put the effort in, they look fantastic. So by way of introduction, local councils can be key allies or obstacles in our plans for community-led change. Transition Together is offering a short cohort program supported by Achilles this June and July to support transition groups to have more impact in their engagement with their local authorities. So participants will share experiences and challenges in this cohort-based program we're looking forward to in June and July and explore different tools and approaches through three online sessions and form a cohort to support each other in their work with councils. We'll also explore how transition groups can hold space for creative community engagement, promote social justice and participation. We'll look at a range of relevant tools for different scales of work, such as a local transformation toolkit and climate emergency centers. And there's some links going in the chat just now for those two things. And tonight kicks off our focus on working with councils. It's the first of those three webinars. The cohort who might go on to do the deeper work will enjoy an introductory webinar to get to know each other, share experiences and bring challenges in our opening workshop, participate in dedicated space on Vive, which is our platform that we've developed for Transition Together. Uh, it's like a, a friendly, ad-free Facebook. There's a link to join Vive going into the chat just now. And we'll access a one hour mentoring session from an expert in the field. Finally, we'll join together for a bespoke closing session. So we'll design that as we go along with this working with councils cohort. Um, it's great to be here tonight. And I'm going to kick off um, our, uh, by introducing our first speaker, Rhiannon Jones, who's from Green Slate Community Farm. Rhiannon's one of the founding directors of Green Slate Community Farm, a 37 acre formerly disused education farm in Wigan. After successfully securing a 25 year lease, the project provides essential therapy based services and education to the local community and beyond. And we look forward to hearing more about it. Rhiannon, over to you. So can everyone see the, uh, the screen right now? Fantastic. Right. So, yeah, uh, we're from Green Slate Community Farm. We're based in Wigan, in specifically in Oral. So we're actually on the border to three counties, really. We're in a bit of a, a weird position. Uh, so the three counties is obviously Greater Manchester, we've got Merseyside and we've got Lancashire as well. So we're actually on the Wigan side of uh, the border, but we are kind of straddling the three counties. But uh, who we are is basically a 37 acre uh, farm. We're semi-urban, so we have got housing um, surrounding us on three sides of us, but the rest of it is kind of goes into the countryside. Um, so we're kind of on the outskirts of Wigan Town Centre. Um, and basically what we're what we're about is um, setting up a community a benefit, uh, sorry, community benefit society originally in 2012, set up by Bill and General Transition Group. And it was set up really with the aim to try and provide like volunteering opportunities, but also therapeutic based activities as well. But basically the whole farm is pretty much run by our volunteers. We do have a small group of staff that do the professional services, such as the therapeutic based activities and the, um, the care farm side, which is working with special educational needs, but the rest, everything else on the ground from the food growing side is all done by volunteers. So what we are actually currently delivering is a load of therapeutic and holistic services. And this can be working with people who are in recovery from drug and alcohol addiction through to PTSD and acquired brain injuries. We also deal with a lot of mental health as well. So we get a lot of referrals through the green social prescribing and we utilize a lot of our activities with food growing and the animal therapy to deliver those services. On top of all of that, we also deliver around about 100 about 112 educational visits per year and that's to schools colleges and universities right the way through to master's level um, we also have regular placements as well we've got a college that are signed up to us which come to us for um every single week and then we also have just the one-off educational visits from schools that might come to do everything from food and farming to field to fork um bio blitz conservation dem building, anything that we can basically do. And we also cover renewable energy as well as a part of our curriculum. 
On top of that, we also run community workshops in everything from backyard chicken keeping to how to do regenerative food growing and um, green woodworking and arts and crafts. So we've got quite a diverse uh, workshops for the older um, kind of cohort. And then we're also a base for a lot of community groups as well. So we run a lot of community groups on site from nature rangers to baby and parenting groups to uh, counselling services and then also uh, have a drugs and alcohol rehabilitation centre based at the, cent at the actual farm as well. So how we actually started, I have to put this slide in, I have a little bit of a giggle because obviously we didn't start from this, it's a little bit too far in the past, but the farm itself has a very, very long history. Um, it dates back right, but it's actually traceable back down to the 1600s. And it's remained in the local authority from that point. Um, but what happened in, to, in the 1980s was Wigan Council um, ran it as an education centre. So they were delivering things around food and farming curriculum, but also history because there's an old uh, roundhouse or the remains of an old roundhouse. So they did a replica and they delivered a lot of the history curriculum from it. Now, the council actually ran out of funding in 1994, and since 1994, it's been left abandoned. Um, it was never used. So that kind of left us with a bit of an opportunity because obviously Wigan Council have emotional ties to this place because they used to run it themselves and they couldn't do it because of lack of funding. So it was a little bit of exploitation on our half that we kind of captured that emotive kind of connection that Wigan Council had about the land being used and the fact that it had been left derelict for so long. And our aim was really just to bring it back as kind of part of the education um, offer for a lot of schools. So when it came to actually working with Wigan Council, it was not easy in the very beginning. Um, we were faced with an awful lot of unanswered emails and un unanswered uh, questions about taking on the land. It took us, in fact, three years to make a breakthrough with them. Um, and that was from us sending emails every two weeks to talking to our local MPs and also getting in touch with local press and doing news releases as well. But the whole way through it, we kept it positive. We never kind of um, talked about Wigan Council in a negative light. We, we, we focused on the positives. We really pushed it forward and said, this is what we're hoping to do with this land. You know, if we can get enough support for it, we can make it happen. And that was the kind of uh, stance that we had on it. And eventually Wigan Council did turn a corner and we have kept them engaged in it from the very beginning right the way through to right now. But I think that the tipping point for us was the austerity that happened in 20, uh, 2010. So when austerity hit, obviously the councils didn't have enough funding to be able to deliver a lot of the services and they were looking at other, way, other ways that communities could actually do it for themselves. So what we actually inherited was this. Um, obviously the land had been disused and abandoned for 16 years. It was completely six foot tall in brambles. Uh, 37 acres of it was completely covered in all kinds. So the only way that you can deal with that kind of thing is get the goats in. Um, we didn't have enough money for tractors or any fancy equipment, but we had a lot of goats. So we put the goats in and we utilised a lot of the regenerative practices that you would use using livestock and using uh, wildlife systems to help kind of regenerate the land. Um, originally, what we asked for was a long term lease. Now, obviously, the council were very reluctant to do that. At the time, we were only just starting off. And like I said about austerity, what happened at that point straight after austerity was Wigan Council kind of changed a little bit of tact as well. They started becoming very, very proactive and they launched something in our area called The Deal, which is basically where they empower communities to actually take on a lot of the assets through an asset transfer and deliver the services that they can't. And the fortunate thing about us is that we were actually ready at that point because for three years prior to that, we had already been chasing them constantly. So when they asked us for a long term, when we asked them for the long term lease, the thing that they asked for was give us a proper full blown proposal. And we were ready for it because we already had a business plan ready. So we not only gave them the proposal, but we also gave them the business plan as well. That kind of showed them that we were serious about it and also the fact that we'd done our research because one thing that we did do was look at the areas that Wigan Council was struggling to provide and we actually uh, put in our business plan that we were going to hit the targets that they were unable to actually achieve themselves. On top of that, when they were asking for uh, a long term lease, they gave us five years initially 
and we did ask for longer um, in order to secure larger bids for, for putting in infrastructure and investment. They gave us a bit of a challenge then. They said if we were to raise £2,500, they would actually give us a longer term lease than five than the five year one that they had offered. And we actually matched it. We did it. So they couldn't really renege on that offer. So we we jumped on it. So basically what we were doing was um, we were approaching them with a very positive manner and we were saying, right, this is what we're offering you know, where do you want us to go from from here? And whenever they came to us with a with a problem, we came to them with a solution. So in the long term, what we have done since then, because obviously uh, that was in 2012 that we managed to get that sorted. Um, ever since then, we've kept Wigan Council completely involved every single step of the way. So we've had them involved in everything from doing the uh, building and the putting in the infrastructure on site, to coming down and involving themselves in team days, having the meeting spaces there for delegates. Whenever they have any VIPs in the area, they always bring them down and we basically schmooze them. Um, we, we're kind of shouting about, you know, what the project's about and how much Wigan Council have helped us. And I think that the positive relationship going forward and keeping them involved every step of the way has helped build up that relationship and that kind of want to help us because we're obviously helping them by hitting targets for them on their behalf and also being a really good flagship project to boast about. It does definitely pay off to keep that relationship going even once you've got your assets, because there has been times in the past 10 years that we've had a few hiccups and we haven't had the skills or the, the know-how within our community group to actually solve the problems. Now Wigan Council have actually jumped in quite a lot and helped us with things like HR, um, applying for grants or even things like uh, finding where resources are and we've got a, a dedicated person in Wigan Council that we know we can go to if we need to make links for anything or any gaps that we, we are missing and um, so that relationship has continued to build year on year. So in all I think that three points of advice that we would give you from our side uh, from our experiences is always remain professional um, because you need to kind of meet them on their level. They're looking for people who they can trust and will know what they're doing and will be able to um, kind of provide a, a professional service because at the end of the day, they're going to be putting their name to it. So if you're remaining professional when you're in like kind of uh, talking with them, then they will have confidence in your ability. And then I think the second one will probably be tap into their needs. If you find the gap that they're missing or they're struggling with and you come up with a solution for it, the more likely to actually approach you and say, yep, let's go ahead with that. Because if you can solve it and we can't, then that's given them one less headache to deal with. And then also the final one is don't give up, because for us, it's taken us a very, very long journey. And I mean, it took us three years of banging our head against a wall, if you want to put it that way, before we got anywhere. And you never know when the opportunity is going to come up. So if you're ready and primed for it, then you've got to be able to be to be able to jump on it straight away. So I think that the the last one is definitely don't give up um, hope because it will happen. And if you do want any other information, you can get in touch with us at any time. Um, obviously, we're on Facebook and Instagram, but also by email. So if there's any specific specific questions or if you want to pop up to have a visit on the site and you know have a little tour around, then by all means, you can you can come along. We welcome everybody. And we're going to move on with no further ado to Nikki Nichols from Transition Exmouth. Nikki is a lifelong campaigner and community activist with work experience in NGOs, Sure Start and local government. Ah, good. As the chair of Transition Exmouth, she is devoting all her spare time, energy and optimism into creating strong community networks, political joined up thinking, and a better understanding of the amazing world we could create through, ju through a just transition. I also know a secret about Nikki. She is a Eurovision super fan. So Nikki, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, I was in Liverpool. I'm a bit overexcited, actually, after my Eurovision moment. I know it's a Marmite thing, but for me, it was a lifetime dream. Um, right, I'm going to share my screen. I feel a little bit like, um, Rhiannon, that was so awesome. You've got 30, how many acres? It's just brilliant. So brilliant. Um, and I feel a bit like I'm the poor cousin down in Devon. Um, we are, hang on, here I go sharing. Um, I can't talk and share. 
Uh, I think it's that one. Hit it. Can you see that? Yes, perfect. So I guess we are maybe a traditional transition group. We're in a big town, the biggest town in Devon. Um, we've got an active bunch um, of us and we've been bimbling along for 15 years, a long time. Um, but I guess we haven't felt that we'd made those connections as such. Um, and we were constantly feeling frustrated that things weren't happening at the pace that we wished that they were. Um, and I think for us, it is a bit about seizing a moment. And I think we probably all recognise the moment um, in 2019 when the school strikes were happening, everything felt maybe there was this new energy, it was all a bit positive. Um, and our council, along with many others, declared a climate emergency. Um, and I think it's fair to say they didn't really know what that meant. And lots of them didn't really know what that meant. Um, so we thought, okay, here's our moment. This is this is when we can perhaps come in and help set that agenda, because we had loads of ideas of what could happen. Um, so essentially this then started from one big meeting. So we put in shed loads of effort to get everybody we possibly could in the town. And we said, this is, this is a big one-off. We want to talk to everybody. We've hired the biggest hall we can find. Um, we've been to every club group, everybody to try and um, really get the energy in the town for what we might look for. A bit of a Rob Hopkins visioning, visioning exercise and with free soup because we know that people come for soup. Um, so we did that and 115 people came and we were totally blown away and thrilled. Um, and here's some photos of us doing our stuff. Um, so our Exmouth, our planet, um, we focused on those kind of the transition themes that you will all know, um, food, waste, buildings, travel, all the stuff um, that we know and love, community. And we set people into their tables to get chatting um, and to meet each other and to think creatively. Um, and we knew that what we wanted to do from this is to build a plan that we could then share with the council and say, this, is, this isn't our idea, this is the idea from your whole community. These are the ideas um, that, that have come out of this meeting. And it was absolutely fantastic. And how lucky we did it then, because literally COVID then hit a few months later. And it, it was, yeah, it was just great that we had all of this um, amazing input from people at that point. So then what that enabled us to do at the same time, um, wider across Devon County Council they were asking uh, for submissions to the Devon Carbon Plan so we were able to submit 50 different ideas from that meeting to the, the Devon Carbon Plan which was great. We then created a 10-point action plan for the Town Council so that we could um, we could go along and say here you go here's 10 things you can do you weren't quite sure um, and I will show you some of those uh, in a minute uh, and also the personal changes so we basically went through all of that information sifted it all through thought what's the big stuff um where's the where's the national i went down the different right down to the personal what can people individually do uh, which we then hoped that we would be able to create um a website and again i'll tell you about that in a minute so seizing the opportunity getting everybody get together thinking through um what people's great ideas and then merging them into the right things to tell the right people. And at that point, the uh, Exmouth Town Council set up a Climate and Ecological Emergency Working Party, Natty title, and we were invited along as, as voting members. So that was great because literally in that first meeting, it, it was a bit of chat about how do we get people using less plastic bottles and not much um, visionary stuff, I suppose. So it was great when we were able to present our 10 point plan um, and then the town council agreed that in the 2019 um, at the end of at the end of that year. And what was brilliant is that budget then came attached to that. So projects that we ordinarily might have been struggling to do an active travel day or thinking about supporting bikeability, all those transition little smaller projects in the town. Suddenly there was some money attached to that because this was the agenda that they a bit like Rihanna's just said, you know, this is what they wanted. We were just helping them do it. So it was perfect. Now, I'm going to show you the 10 point plan on the proviso. You promise not to just sit there and read it because Rich has told me that there's too many words on this slide. And there are too many words on this slide, but you can look at it later. 
but I just want to give you a flavor of what those things are. So it goes from really big stuff, like we want to create an eco hub or a climate emergency center. So that's the biggie, straight in at number one, but then trying to get lots of different aspects for them. So um, talking about the use of pesticides and fertilizer, thinking about biodiversity, um, uh, to the bikeability, uh, to some educational programs, um, drinking water fountains. I can't tell you how much effort it took to get those, but we now have three of them in. Um, through to them thinking about, for them, I think they were still using Nestle and weren't thinking through having their own house in order. Um, and talking about active travel. So trying to get a bit of a range in there of lots of different things um, that they could be involved with. And then really we just started working our way through it. And it was a combination of us um, and them and some of the officer time and some of the counselors. Um, it was a real mix um, and some were easy wins. So I'd say uh, the use of pesticides, that was quick and easy for them. Um, getting lots of bikes together, um, for repair and then to use for bikeability, that was relatively straightforward. Um, our big one was we want to get this website up and running. And I, it's a tiny plug for this website because I haven't really, we haven't been able to put enough time into it. And I think it actually could be really cool. So it, it's called Our Place, Our Planet. And I think there's a little link to it. And essentially it's giving people not only the kind of first things that you as an individual can do to help reduce your carbon footprint but crucially it then links to things in our town that help them to do that and we've written developed the website so any town can then be linked into that so you would just need to put all of your all of your stuff in like where are your farm shops where are your bike shops and it will then work in in the program so it's it's what a clever little gizmo. And they they paid for that. The town council paid for that. And that is something we're going to be working on in the coming years to really pushing that out to people. Um, and here we are launching it. There's me and the mayor. We had to do it by Zoom because it was still COVID. But the mayor and I and his consort, we went and stood there and um, had a lovely moment. Nice to see a little picture. Um, so the one big thing that um, they also did, which was great, was uh, our recommendation that they have a full carbon audit. So they, they did pay for someone to come in. And the key thing that that um, report showed is the one thing they as a town council could do was to help educate their citizens. Um, so, yes, they might change to an electric vehicle and they can get rid of pesticides. But the key thing to do is to get the information out to people. And that was great. because That's where we could say this website is going to help you do that and we will help you to do that. And finally, so we're going to move on to this is the biggie. So this is the one we've now come on to. And I guess we are now able to talk about a big project because we've we've been working with them for three years. They really trust us now. Um, they believe that we do have exciting and visionary ideas and that maybe, you know, we put the work in and we can make it happen. So we're currently working on trying to turn this very attractive 1980s toilet block which is in the most beautiful setting. If you turn round from that picture, you have the X estuary, which is a triple SI and it's a RSPB nature reserve. It's beautiful, it's beautiful. Um, and it's a lovely toilet block. And actually we just this week got the first architect's plans back as to what it could look like. And it's so much better than the vision on the right. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, we haven't got all the money to do it, but what we're what we're doing is trying to up the vision and trying to talk about um, all the possibilities of what this could actually be. Um, and I think I think that's going well. Here's hoping this actually happens. Uh, I was thinking though today, you know, even if this doesn't happen, and even if this is a project, we will be tenacious and we will keep going with it. We have learned so much. We've made so many connections, and I really believe it will happen somewhere, even if it doesn't happen in that particular attractive toilet block. Um, so the big news for me, I suppose, is that they understood how much there is to do and that at the end of last year, they employed a climate change officer, which for a town council that's you know not massive is a really big deal. She's three days a week. Um, they recognised that their officer time wasn't nearly enough to put into it. And I really do believe that that happened because of the work we've done together and that they could see that need. 
Um, so this is now a game changer because it's wonderful. Zoe has come into her into her role and together now this feels like we really can push forward. So I'm hoping that ours is a little story of optimism, not giving up, but also quite crucially, I think, seeing that opportunity to set the agenda and to help them set the agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nikki. That was amazing and inspiring and, and great to hear. For our next speaker, um, who is Emily Walker Smith from Camden Think and Do. Emily has been working with Think and Do since November 2022. And the projects she works on are Business Connections with Camden Council's Climate Alliance and the Sharing Spaces Project, which aims to open up underused community halls to local residents for free so they can share food, skills, and stuff with all with a climate and a social justice lens. Emily is also coordinator of the Camden Friends of the Earth group and has recently worked on the Transform Our Future London gathering with us at Transition Together, which was an utter joy. Emily, the floor is yours. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, thank you for the intro, Chris. Um, I was actually seeing some lovely similarities in our um, stories, Nikki. So I am um, this might sound quite familiar to you as well. Um, so yeah, Think and Do, we started in 2019 because our council also declared a climate emergency then. And in Camden, they held the first citizens assembly. It has its criticisms, but they did it. Um, and one of the outcomes of that Camden citizens assembly on the climate and ecological emergency was to mobilize the community. Um, so, Georgia Gold, who's our leader of the council, um, met with Rob Hopkins and had these wonderful visioning and imagination sessions. And the idea for Think and Do, the name comes from there being lots of thinking in the climate crisis and not lots of doing. So we brought the two together and we think and we do. Um, since then, we've gone through a bit of a journey. Um, we had this lovely shop. It was a meanwhile space on Kentish Town Road. Um, it's now a kebab shop. Um, but we had it for half a year before the pandemic came. Um, we had workshops, we had gatherings, talks, lunches, you know, all sorts of things in this shop. And it was a real um, lively space. Um, and it was a really great moment to start building that relationship with the council. The council gave it us for free. A lot of their officers came in um, to the shop to enjoy it. Georgia Gold, leader of the council, called it her happy place. Um, so we started off on a really good um, kind of level with the council. Um, when the pandemic came, we moved online, as many things did, but we tried to keep going um, with webinars on lots of different topics, cooking together and trying to just keep people sane. Um, but really the magic has come after the pandemic and that's um, kind of what I'm gonna talk you through now is where we are today. Um, one of the things that um, I found in the green slate in your um, picture, Rhiannon, was this uh, mention of, of keeping things positive. And, and that's really something that we've also tried to do um, at Think and Do is, is keep that relationship with the council because it's special. And if you have it, you know, you need to look after it. Um, so one of the things that I thought could be interesting to talk through now is kind of stakeholder mapping in the council. There's lots of different departments. Um, I've got some little pictures on these next two slides, next few slides of our different projects. Um, we have a beeline, which is trying to match and link up all of these um, green spaces in Camden. Um, and this kind of just highlights the different departments that are involved on a council side and then also the community partners that we have so working with sustainability green spaces air quality you know like bringing in as many people as possible um, to our projects from the council means that they're all in the loop and they can't in the end say you didn't tell us about this um, because we've literally told everyone we possibly can um, another one of our projects communities again in including as many people as we possibly can, ground maintenance, the contractors that are gonna try and cut down our trees because they think they're weeds, 
include them early on so they know where things are going and they're keeping in touch with the plans. Um, sustainability, the, that department are our friends. We try to be critical friends of them while also keeping the um, relationship positive. Um, here's another of our projects, Energy Savers Club. This one includes housing a little bit more um, than the other ones do because we are kind of going into um, people's houses on some points to change their light bulbs for them. Tenants participation as well is a really um, unknown department in the council until you get in there, tenants participation. Every council estate has its own TP, they call them, tenants participation officer who technically should be going to that estate regularly. They've set a goal as once a year. Whether that's regular, that's uh, up for you to decide, but the council think it is, um, so it's better than nothing. Um, so that's just a little uh, idea of kind of how we've done our stakeholder mapping, keeping people in the loop. Um, and if you visualize it, get it down, write it down, it really helps so that you can tick people off once you've spoken to them. Um, challenges as well, you know, we, of course, everything has its challenges. Um, one of ours, while being positive, and trying to have that good relationship with the council is sometimes being seen as its mouthpiece. Um, they also sometimes might take credit for our ideas um, and put it in their council climate action plan as their own, but you know, they're doing it. So who gets the credit doesn't really matter as long as these changes are happening. So sometimes it's it can be seen as a challenge, but if you have, um, if you're humble, I guess, and you really mind that, then it, it doesn't really bother us too much. Um, it's, because there's all these different council departments involved, sometimes it's hard for them to take ownership of specific things and pass things across to different departments. It's a business, in, ultimately, really. So that happens everywhere. So keeping people in the loop, having as many people seed in, CC'd into an email as possible, does tend to overcome this challenge, especially the heads of departments, if you can find them. Um, council slowness, as you said, Rhiannon, they, they do move slowly. Um, and Nikki, I'm sure you found this as well. Um, getting things approved takes a long time. Sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness rather than permission, um, especially with these councils. Once they see that you're doing a good job, then they'll, they're more likely to say yes again. Um, and also the council silos, I kind of touched on this already. Sometimes they don't talk to each other, which is weird, like green spaces and housing really should talk to each other because they work on literally the same land. But sometimes they don't. So CC everyone into your emails to make sure that they're all in the loop. Um, one thing that we did uh, at the council offices, which was a really exciting opportunity, we got to hold a after afternoon or morning in their, after, in their environmental stewardship module which the head of sustainability has built and we got to run a world cafe um, for the council officers and we had all these themes that you guys have already mentioned kind of touching on their council departments transport air quality uh, built environment and we had experts on each of those tables and got all these silos of council departments who never talked to each other talking to each other. There was even someone there from procurement. It was wild um, talking to him about who does what and how they get their contracts. So if you have the opportunity to get in and hold one of these sessions, I really recommend it. It was just fascinating to hear some of their stories and, and how they don't work with each other. Here's some of the activities. I won't read through them because again, it is too many words on a slide, but you will get these slides afterwards so you can have a peruse at your leisure. Um, and then here's just some tips, which I'm sure you're already doing for your own projects. A few questions. What departments does your project link to? How can you speak their language? You know, if they are doing a climate action plan, pick out the words from that and use their words against them so that they cannot say no. Um, invite your important people, your councillors, your MPs, 
the leader of the council to your events so that they see it in action. If they've seen you having a good impact, it makes it really hard for them to say no next time. Um, focus on the positives, as we've said, build trust, be patient, they move slowly. Um, so yes, we have to speed them up, but sometimes that, that council pace is what we've got to deal with. And yes, that's it. I hope I've gathered us back some time um, and there will be time for questions at the end. So thank you so much. I'll stop sharing. Thanks so much, Emily. Give you some applause there, Zoom applause. Uh, thanks so much, Emily. That was really fantastic. And our fourth speaker this evening is Claire Cherry from a project called The Great Collaboration which came out of Herefordshire Green Network. So from the wilds of North London to the expanses of Herefordshire, um, this is countywide work. And Claire is currently acting project coordinator for Herefordshire Green Network's Great Collaboration Project. She also sits on Herefordshire Green Network's steering group and in the past was a trustee at the Centre for Alternative Technology, one of my favorite places. <laughs> Claire's background is in project development and management in the public and charity sectors. So Claire, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And before I share my screen, I just want to give you a little bit of background on the project because the, the slides are all about the project. And I just want to give you the context for it. So Herefordshire Green Network, absolutely Richard. Herefordshire, very different from the other wonderful presentations, is uh, you know, is a rural county, very much a rural county. And the projects I'm going to tell you about is about working with parishes. And they range from being very small, sort of uh, 200 residents or uh, households to quite, you know, large thousands of residents. So very big differences in the parishes. It was set up by Herefordshire Green Network, which is essentially a membership organisation across Herefordshire, um, after some roadshows around parishes and town councils in 2019, which were to um, ask what the parishes, what the parish councils, what the town councillors wanted to help them get to net zero. And what they came up with was essentially um, the great collaboration. So I'm share my screen now and tell you a bit more about it. So what the councillors wanted was a toolkit essentially to help them make contact and identify what it was that local residents wanted themselves as individuals, but also some ideas and some resources about what they could do as parish councils. So the, the project um, was set up with some amazing funding. It ended up being two years funding. Um, and the idea was that it should be open source. The whole thing should be open source, um, but that it would have the aim of being um, spread out across the country. Uh, if, eventually if it worked. So it was a proof of concept project. And um, the, what, the, the website, which was you know, some entrepreneurial designer, creative, wonderful people set up before I even joined Herefordshire Green Network, uh, got going just as COVID hit. So the other part of the project, which is the sort of facilitator role, the outreach role to go with the website, um, was kind of put on a bit of a hold. It was very hard for the lovely Beth who held the post before I, I came along um, to really get going on it. Let me tell you a bit about the toolkit itself. So um, what it allows you to do is to um, look at 60 different actions you can take. So yes, I know it's the same as several other websites that are out there and we've already heard of one <laughs> tonight. Um, so 60 actions, you can click on those actions um, and they're all under headings. So yes, these are the headings that you would expect them to be under. They're all under headings. Um, and what you do when you click on them is you get information about links to other sources of resources. You get information about what actions you can take and you give some, give some options. Uh, and that the, each of the options tells you what your kind of carbon reduction would be and what your um, what kind of money you might save. So uh, um, if you have a look on these slides here, there's four little actions here that you can see. They've got CO2, 
with an arrow going down and they've got a pound sign one or three or free. So that's how much cost cost you to do it. And for each of these actions, you can choose. I'm going to commit to do this. I've already done it, um, but I or I can't do it. Um, and if you can't do it, and that's what this slide is showing, then it then gives you some options about what, why you can't do it. So it's not right for me right now. Um, I don't have the information. I can't afford it. Um, I need some support to do it. Um, and this is the key really to the whole toolkit, which makes it a bit different to, to other toolkits, we think, in that when you register to take these actions, you give your postcode, you give your name and a, a, a username and an email address and a postcode. And there's a widget at the back that because of the postcode, it creates a report. And that's available, it's actually available to anyone. Um, but it specifically is useful for the parish councils. So this, this one here, you can see, um, tells you get on board with public transport, huge, huge issue for Herefordshire. Rural transport is an enormous issue for Herefordshire. Really big one to crack as well, really difficult to crack. Um, and on this occasion with this report in this parish, four people said they couldn't do it. For other, three were for other reasons. One, it's not applicable to my situation. Switch it all, switch it to renewable gas. We are mainly oil fueled in Herefordshire. There's very little um, mains gas. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's a big issue there. Three people, two were other, it's not applicable to my situation. There's one down there for joining the elect uh, electric vehicle trend. I don't feel confident in this. So what this has allowed the parish councils to do that have joined the great collaboration is to look at this information uh, when people have signed on and done the actions in their parishes and look at this information and say and help them identify how they can use their money, use their time, use their effort to respond to the need. That sounds really simple. It's not that simple. Um, and one of the um, challenges that we have is to uh, is to get people to sign up for the great collaboration toolkit so the way we've done that is to support the parishes through the outreach work which is what I'm doing at the moment the facilitator role to start declaring a climate emergency to set up some sort of action plan to um, have an environment working group as part of the parish council and that environment group to then look at taking what actions they can. And in a minute, I'll show you some slides of some of the actions that some of those groups have taken. We also, on the toolkit, provide resources. So there is a, there's a, there's a declaration of a climate and ecological emergency. Um, there is a, a, an action plan, which we know can be better, and we want to work on that, but we know there's a form of an action plan. We also provide resources, so really easy, copy and paste resources for social media so that Facebook, Twitter, posters are easy to do to um, set up some sort of thematic event uh, or to run a campaign or to just flag up with people that actually, while they're booking their holidays in January after they've had a really miserable Christmas with their family, that um, actually is probably best not to be flying uh, long haul if they, or, you know, or just across to France if they could get on a train and do it instead. Um, so let me show you some images to just tell you about what some of the parishes have done. So these are some launch events. Um, on the left hand side, you can see uh, some of the social media uh, resources there that can be can be used. In the middle was uh, um, Colwell Greener, which is nor near Malvern, had a huge whole day event. They had something like 400 people turn up to this event. They had about 20 stalls. Um, they they had soup. Yes, soup. They had soup and uh, cakes and whatnot. Cakes are also good for getting people in then. If you can get free cakes, if you can get people to volunteer to make them, even better. Um, and it really started off, they'd had some, they'd had some community environment group work going on in the past, which had, as many do, I kind of lost its energy. The people involved were just had run out of energy to do it. And this gave them a new boost. Um, and they did it with the help of the great collaboration resources. The little picture there on the side um, 
uh, is a, a very, very small parish called King's Capel, where as part of a parish council AGM, they provided curry and cider, food again, and alcohol this time, um, and invited people to come in. And that little room was absolutely packed. They had six tables, each of them with a theme, um, a piece of paper with a theme written on the top. So one of them was nature. And they asked people to go around and write on those pieces of paper what they thought they could do in the community. On that particular night, just as a result of the conversations that went on, the local primary school head teacher happened to be there. And they said to the community, well, we've got recycling facilities and bins in our playground. We can just put them outside the door and you can use them. It's like, wow, that was easy. <laughs> As a, you know, a quick make, I went there last week to see how they were getting on. Um, and they were talking about doing no mo may, and that's across that little parish. They've got uh, little posters up on um, on uh, posts all across the parish saying, "We're looking after nature, no mo may." Um, so these are the things, the kind of things that happened. Just one more picture to show you what's been going on. So this uh, was um, Archerfield Community Environment Group, which is part of a parish council. The chair of the parish council is also the chair of the environment group. This parish has actually set aside some of its precepts towards responding to the environment and um, ecological crisis and to supporting the actions of the environment group. They had a waste day on April the 1st. Um, and the Imaginarium, I hope you can see right in the middle, was um, a competition for children to make things out of waste that could be reused. Uh, so we call them an inventors competition. And we had a real inventor there as well. who was showing what he makes out of waste. And then on the right hand side that we had a sustainable fashion show and that wedding dress is made out of plastic bag, pack, sorry, plastic bags and pill packets. Um, so some really exciting um, things there. Um, and um, just to talk a little bit about um, what we've learned really, we operate at county and at parish level. So at county level, um, Herefordshire Green Network, which is the kind of parent body for the project, is, um, is on what are called climate and nature partnership boards in the county. So they can represent the great collaboration and other projects there in the county, at county level. And we do get invited to council, parish councillor events that the county sets up to tell them about the projects, including the great collaboration. And that's a great help. There's been a sort of growth in interest that's beginning to roll because um, what I mean is kind of snowball. And, and that's because as soon as we start publicizing one event, another parish will hear about it and want to learn about it. And we link them together, then we'll do peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer linking. Um, and if there's a, a good source of information or resources, then we'll share those resources. So another little parish can, doesn't have to spend their time looking for those resources. We can share them and we learn from a previous project. Um, so we can share that sort of thing through the county council networks. Rather confusingly though, um, the county set up what they called a greener footprints website, which does almost exactly the same as we do, <laughs> except they don't have the report in the background. It's about taking action and it's linking them to activities going out in the council and there's room for both. They're not quite the same, but it has caused a bit of con confusion. We did look to see whether we could combine the two. The headaches and the time and the conversations that went into trying to combine the two for both sides was really ended up as not being worth it. So it was like, okay, we'll stay as friends. You do your thing, we do our thing, and that's fine, and we'll support each other. At Paris, yeah, we're loving. Sorry, we're loving your presentation, but I'm just really mindful of time. Okay, okay, I'll just so. okay. Very, very quickly then. Thank you. Face to face um, works best at kind of introducing it at AGMs and parish events. Peer to support, peer to peer support is really important. Having off the shelf resources is important. Having case studies is important, and having one or two councillors that are really enthusiastic makes a big, big difference. Um, it can get stuck if you've got just one councillor that won't engage, uh, and that's a bit of a problem. That's me done. Sorry for going over time. That, thank you so much, Claire. That was great. And thank you to all our speakers for such rich and practical and thoughtful presentations, um, and obviously a lot of preparation as well. We have a bit of time now um, to, to have some questions and um, if there are things from your own situation that you're, you're interested 
um, or questions from the presentations. Um, it would be fantastic if you would like to put those questions in the chat just now. And while you're, you're thinking of what you'd like to ask, um, we're just going to kick off by asking each of the speakers to share one thing which has really struck them um, in the talks we've heard this evening. So I'm going to go in the order that you spoke. Um, because Rhiannon's had a little rest now since she did her presentation. But Rhiannon, I wonder if there's one thing that's coming up from you from what you've heard, just very briefly. I think from listening to all the other um, organisations all over the country, we all kind of have the same issues and kind of came to the same conclusion. And that's the only way we came about it. So it's refreshing to actually know that we're not an island on our own and we it's not just an us thing it's actually a it seems to be a common theme and although it's frustrating it's quite comforting to know that it's it's not just something that was going on just here um, and that it is just a, a gene a, like a general thing that happens that's great thank you Rhiannon um, I'm going to turn now to Nikki who went next Nikki what one thing is really um, jumping up for you I think the one word that's sticking out for me is positivity. It seems that everybody's had to just be a bit tenacious, but really positive and just keep on going in the face of really slow councils, because I think that is the one thing. They are slow, aren't they? But in the long run, it sounds like it has paid off that positivity and patience mm. in many cases. Thank you very much, Nikki. Emily, what's your one thing? You both took mine and my backup. Um, similarities and positives are definitely something that really came through. And um, we're all the same. And, and you're right, you know, we sometimes do all feel different and we're in this battle alone, but we've gone through very similar journeys, which, which really does tell us something. That's great, thank you so much. And Claire? Yeah, I was just madly typing a response in the chat, but um, I, I, I think, yes, the same as everybody else. It's lovely, the positivity. And I think one of the things right at the beginning that Rhiannon said was about um, having a non-critical approach to stakeholders and partners, particularly the council, and just trying to find the hook that works for them. And um, Emily and Nikki, you know, said the same things, really trying to be the support for the council rather than um, in any way compete or niggle, niggle them. I think that's really important too. Thanks very much, Claire. Great. Well, we have a few questions in the chat. Please keep popping them in there. There's still time. Um, there's a few uh, nuts and bolts questions, Claire, about your website. And I wonder if we might um, address those first. Um, yep. And hopefully they're probably quite, quite um, quick and cut and dry to answer. Um, Jess from Stroud is asking about whether the toolkit includes like parish and planning level actions or just things for individuals to take. No, so the toolkit includes um, resources that it's all open source. There's a little button at the top that says local councils, but it's for actually for anybody. And that links currently links to a simple Google Drive that's got the marketing materials anybody can use. It's got the um, action plans anybody can use. Um, I, and we are, I didn't have a chance to say, but the, that we are negotiating at the moment with, with bigger partners. We're very small as a network with bigger partners to develop the, the, the website even further so that it can offer even more. Mm. Does that so answer your question, Jess? Um, yeah, I mean, so so I, I, I run a similar network in Stroud called the Climate Action Network. Yeah. Um, and yeah so so we i'm in a good position in that many of the count districts town and parish councils have declared climate emergencies which is awesome um but um i guess i was just wondering if there were resources for the parishes in particular to help them um look at their own policies rather than just you know encourage residents to take individual action yeah. um policies maybe not yet but actually let me make a note of that because that's something that i think should be in there i mean there's there's templates but not necessarily policies as such um our okay. experience is once they've declared an emergency they can have an environment group the environment group seems to develop the actions rather than having a policy to um 
Having said that, we do have a parish that's its annual plan includes its response to the climate emergency. So I guess, you know, that's the sort of thing that could be included as in a case study or as, a, as an example. But thank you. Actually, that's a great. Yeah, well, I'll be I'll be trawling through the site. I know it existed. So it's just magic for me. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and potentially, you know, uh, some resources that might be useful to you both or that might be worth a further conversation. Absolutely. Get in touch, Jess. Please do. Yeah, we'll do. Fantastic. Andrew um, from Wimslow was also asking about the website and whether it's relevant to any area or just in Herefordshire. I think you've addressed that in the chat, but maybe you want to just um, no, yeah, say the, it out loud so everyone hears. Yeah, the, that. Uh, absolutely. The aim is with these partners and that was the, the funding was given in the first place that it wouldn't just stay in Herefordshire, that it would spread out if it could across the country. So it is available now. You do have to have a critical mass of engagement to, vet, to develop that, that report that came up that said how many people wanted to do, how many people needed help or were taking actions. Um, so that takes a bit of investment, but the resources are in there for anybody anyway. Um, and, um, you know, there's ideas in there for individuals, but there's ideas in there for parishes too. So yeah, or, or towns, and, and we think possibly schools and maybe businesses, who knows? Let's see how far it can go. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions from Emily. Um, Emily, your first question is about the questionnaire. Is that still the Great Collaboration website questionnaire you were thinking of? Do you want to go ahead and? Yeah, and I think it follows on really nicely, actually, from what you just said, Claire. Um, the, out, the answers that come out of that survey, mm. having other as an option really doesn't give you much information. So how do you go about getting around that when you know, three of the answers to no can't do is other. So what the parishes have tended to do is run some sort of event on a theme. So, for example, one of them had a um, an energy day because there seemed to be several people saying they couldn't do a whole house report or they couldn't they didn't know how to do um, to take actions to do insulation. So they ran an energy day and they brought in some expert information like 7Y Energy and we had um, Octopus Energy had a had a stand there and things like that, and um, that that then be, could become a consultation focus as well. So you could kind of bring people in with information, um, offer some talks. We had some people that talking about the retrofit that they'd done in their own home, um, and uh, but also have uh, conversations going on around coffee tables with free cake um, to. Um, to get people talking about what they needed and get more answers that way. So it was a kind of starting point, a red flag. OK, this is something people need more help with. Ethical finance, huge, huge. You know, how can we help people make choices about money? OK, let's start a conversation and see where we can help. So it does. It may not pinpoint exactly what people need from that result, but it gives you a flavour of, of what the issues are. That's great. Emily had a second question, which also touches on a question of Rich's, which is about um, does it make an impact the flavour of your council politically? Um, and Rich was asking about any change, councils which have changed um, leadership, um, changed political party um, in charge and whether that's affected the, the, the relationships and the way you've been able to collaborate. And I, I asked that to any of the speakers um, who have a perspective on that. Claire. Sorry, me again. Um, <laughs> Herefordshire has been independent green led for the last four years, which has been great, which is where the nature and climate um, partnership boards came in. Mm -hmm. um, we've now just gone back to probably Tory and heaven knows and, and Lib Dems. So heaven knows what will happen now, whether that the change of focus, you know, that's one of the joys of working in that political system isn't it it changes so yeah but it has been good it has when it was uh, independent and green it worked very well Rhiannon what's your yeah, experience we've always predominantly been Labour um, and it wasn't necessarily a change of a uh, political party for us but it was a change in our um, chief executive of the council that was actually mm -hmm. the trigger for us so obviously austerity had hit and then about it took about a year but there was a change around in our um our chief exec within the council it came to a, a lady who came in who was very very forward thinking and very much involved in you know giving back to the community and having the community empowered about it so 
she was the one who actually changed it around for us really so although it wasn't a different political party it was definitely a, diff a different kind of influence from the top that helped for us um but yeah and, and ever since then it's kind of remained a Labour council so it's it has remained being a, a very positive influence for us especially because they launched you know the, the deal which is um the project that the council ran to give back to the community and also assist with uh, asset transfer but not only that but also grant um access to grants as well to help with that sort of thing to empower the community to do it for themselves good to hear anyone else rich I'm going to chip in, yeah, from the London gathering at the weekend, um, we had an open space um, session where anyone could suggest a topic to discuss in the middle of the day on Sunday. And the first one to come up was from my friend Ross over in um, uh, Transition Town, Ilford in East London. And she offered a conversation is how do we welcome in the Tories? Now, I'm not going to make any assumption about political leanings in this group at all. Uh, but it led to a really rich conversation about like not being calcified, not kind of getting stuck in assumptions about certain groups and thinking very ever more flexibly about how we can reach out, not reach out necessarily, but how we can think um, nimbly, malleably about what we're talking about to different people from different political backgrounds, perhaps, or different, you know, different sides of debates and whatnot. And indeed, that goes way beyond politics to cultural backgrounds and everything else as well. But it was a really breakthrough moment for my friend Debbie, uh, Emily's colleague up there in North London. She said, I really, yeah, it was a really good reminder to, um, to kind of break down those assumptions about certain backgrounds or what you hear on Twitter or, you know, those kind of sound bites we hear about certain people along the way. And it seemed to call to this conversation around change of council uh, leadership as well. Um, yeah, so I thought I'd offer that little butterfly and pollinating from that space to here. Rich, while you're there, you had a question also about the difference between working with elected officials and council officers um, and, you know, whether there's any kind of reflections about what was easier or more tricky or different approaches that were needed. Exactly that, the relationships you all have had between with officers compared to with elected officials. How's that all played out in your projects? Yeah. Nikki, I wonder if you've got anything, any experience on that? I was just reading that next question. Sorry, but I was back to answer that one. <laughs> just before you do answer that one. Um, uh, just asking about the difference between working with elected officials and working with council officers and whether you yeah. need a different approach. Yeah, um, I, our council is very, it, it's, uh, what do they call it when it's not led by one party? So we've it's a really big mix. Um, I, I think the officers are much more busy, actually. And if you can get the right councillors who are the ones on your particular working group, often they've got more time. Um, but they obviously inevitably then have to take it back to groups to get decisions. So it, it, it's different, but it's working out who you have to ask for which bit, isn't it? And where the influence is. Mm. And any tips on actually doing that? I mean, how do you work that out? Is it through conversation and dialogue? And Yeah, I do a lot of going for walks with people <laughs> and say, should we take our flask to the beach and chat about it and try and have like half hour conversations with strategic people? Mm. So the human relationships really help. Definitely, yeah. Jess, Jess, you had another question. Do you want to explain where you're coming from and what's planned in Stroud? Sorry, I was just reading the chat as well. Um, I'm, I'm not the best at multitasking. Um, thanks for all your input so far, by the way. It's been really, really rewarding for me to hear from everyone. Um, yeah, um, it's it's not actually my project. It's a different organisation that's going to be running a citizens assembly in in Stroud coming up. And I just noticed that um, at least two two of you guys um, mentioned that you had them as kickoff events, as is you know pretty common. Um, so transition Stroud has existed for a long time, um, and will be no doubt involved with citizens assembly, and that probably means that I'm going to be involved in some capacity and um we just had our initial meeting about the, the very beginnings of what that kind of thing looks like uh this week earlier this week 
So it's just been on my mind um, if there are any sort of pitfalls to look out for. Um, the biggest concern I have is around representation and involving wide part, you know, wide, every aspect of the community that we can. Um, that that's my biggest concern, I guess. I just I think uh, someone mentioned that it was controversial. I, I just picked up on that and I thought, oh, maybe I could ask. Can I chip in there? Yes, please do. I I think for me it's being conscious to make sure everyone is heard, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have the microphone and they have the room. So making sure you've got really good facilitators on each table and you've briefed your facilitators. Uh, so we used our umbrella group mostly and some of the some of the councillors um, and then really briefing them what it is you're trying to get out of that time. And then ensuring that you your feedback is, um, you know, give us your three highlights or whatever it is, but it isn't an opportunity for someone to come up with a massive big thing of flip chart paper and stand at the microphone and talk at you for 10 minutes. And that seemed to work well. We seemed to hear every, yeah. And it was very clear from the beginning, there will be an opportunity for you all to be heard. All right, yeah. Emily, did you have anything to chip in from the Camden experience? Yeah, um, I wasn't too close to it at the time, um, but I know someone who was very vocal about why it was not the best citizens assembly um, who's in XR. And I'm sure you'll have XR contacts down in Stroud, but I can help put you in touch with this um, individual if you'd like uh, to talk through. I think she works with XR on citizens assembly specifically. So if you want the hookup, I can um, link you and I'm sure they'll be able to um, tell you everything that I can't. Thanks. Yeah, useful. I'll, I'll send you my email. I'm I'm really interested in the other um, groups that are on the chat uh, on the call tonight, and whether you have experience of trying to work with council or working with council, and and whether your experience has been similar or different or raised other challenges. Um, so I throw it open to the floor. Anybody who who is um, not a speaker but would like to share a little bit about their their relationships with their council. Bowie, am I saying your name correctly? Bowie, Bowie, doesn't matter. Thank you for checking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what would you um, like to share? Yeah, I, I feel like here, um, I live in Costa Rica and um, we, we mainly teach composting and we have been partnering with municipalities on expanding these projects to different um, government institutions. And I realized that, that one of the things that councils are really good at are connecting or rather municipalities, right? They're connecting you with, with the right people. Um, they know where the needs are and they know where they can't deliver. So I, I relate to the point of identifying what their needs are so that you can speak to that. Um, another thing that I found helpful is um, numbers because they're good at delivering, they're good at making those connections and relationships for you. And then, and then, you know, we carry out the projects, we compost and they love to hear numbers. Like how much do we compost and the, how many people do we give workshops to? So all of those things, kind of keeping a good track of those things so that, you know, they, they scratch your back, you stretch theirs, right? You give them a little bit of results to show um, to the public. So that's been our experience here. Thank you. That's great. And I'm sure councils the world over enjoy numbers. Um, I wonder if there's any other groups who'd like to share. Andrew, how is it in Wimsley? I was interested to hear whether any groups had really been working on making sure they've got lots of councillors who are members of their groups. Because mm. we've got some hand, Wilmslow Town Council has just been taken over by residents of Wilmslow. And I don't know how many of them are our members of our group, but there are certainly some very key members. The same has actually happened on the county council, but actually some some of the active Climate Alliance people from other transition groups have lost their seats. So mm. very interesting, though, to see whether has that helped any group, because it's a new one for us. And uh, So they've just, Andrew, have they just, just been elected in the recent elections? So one or two are in already, and we've now got several mm. more. Right, and so you must have high hopes of strong impact in the coming coming time. Anybody else had that experience? I know there's one transition group in, I think it's Landrindod, who has quite a lot of councillors, or it could be 
one of the other Welsh groups that I can't remember the name of, but they've got quite a lot of members of the council um, among their membership. Um, so certainly at least the channels of communication are very strong and open there. Anybody else have that experience? Yeah, we've, because uh, we're a community benefit society that we set up the farm with, um, we've obviously got membership. Now the membership, it's, um, it's kind of like a parity, no matter how many uh, kind of shares that somebody has, they can only vote once regardless. And um, anyone can become a member. And the share is not for money value, it's just literally so that you can vote at the AGM uh, on like the big decisions. So in the very early days when we set that membership up, we actually did invite all of the councillors and we had three of them take us up on it. So we've got, actually got three councillors. Now, unfortunately, two of them have, are no longer councillors, but one of them still is. And that's actually helped us a little bit because obviously we're with them being a member and being able to come and vote, it's kind of stood us in good stead with the with with other councillors because the reputations got out there. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been working with them now, um, but that was only a little bit later on. It did actually come a little bit later. So by then we'd already got obviously the lease on it. But when it came to get, getting all the other additional support, when I said about keeping the relationship going, even after you've got your lease or you've got your property or you've got your, you know, what you wanted out of them, keep that relationship positive. It's been really good because it's opened up a lot of doors for us to access further support along the line, even now. And it's because of our relationships that we've had and also helping to have the councillors vested interest on the actual projects as well. That's great. I'm just doing a final check that I haven't. Oh, Bob has shared some experience here in the chat, just beginning to engage with our local authority on the issue now. So it's been good to come to this meeting tonight, but not yet any experiences to share. We'll have to have a replay in a, in a year or two and hear the, the what's going on there and how it's made a difference in Wimslow. Um, and Cyril has got any advice on starting a relationship with a council? That's a great question. How would you, those who are, maybe this will be our final question to wrap things up, but those, those um, from the speakers who've been obviously working with councils for very many years, any advice for somebody who's just wanting to reach out and start that relationship? Who would like that question? Emily. Um, for me, we were lucky to have people that had a strong relationship already. So I would say, don't reinvent the wheel, find a person that already has the relationship and use them because Starting a new building trust takes time, takes effort. Whereas if you have someone that already has it, make them your friend. That's a great tip. Anybody else? I just come back to the human level and don't rely on emailing people. Go and find them and find out what excites them and where you overlap and, and talk and you will find good people. They don't put themselves forward to be councillors unless they want to do something good in the community. Rich. Yeah, just gonna, it's made me think about Transition Town Tooting in Southwest London where I live and participate in and thinking of the amount of people who have come along to our events, they're already doing things in the community like Nikki was just saying, and they've decided to put themselves forward as councillors and indeed got that councillor position. So this is the elected officials. Uh, their journey in, they have been hanging out with us for quite a few years, even before they've become councillors. So I wonder who was kicking around the kicking around the scene in Pimlico for you, Cyril, but elsewhere, you know, you know, doing community-based projects kind of with knowledge, stepping into that councillor position with knowledge of the local scene. Um, they may be really good people to root out. Um, and indeed, I know some transitioners around the country as well who've stepped into council officer positions. So we've, we're infiltrating slowly. I guess that would be it. It's just a question trying to find the spies. That's great. Listen, we're going to wrap up the... Qu oh, Jess, a last... No, I, I was... Um, I haven't always been involved with Transition Stroud, relatively um, new to this organisation done other tra transitions yeah. this is the closest I've ever worked with councils and we work at all the levels mm. um and so it's not personal experience but just observation really 
the vast majority of the councillors that we work with, they're already in the Green Party. So just cosy up to your Green Party <laughs> gatherings, go to their meetings. They all have their like little seminars and, you know, all that stuff. Go stalk them. They're, they're your future reps if they're not already your reps. <laughs> That's great. Listen, it's been such an interesting uh, conversation. I really appreciate the thought our speakers have given to the topic and to their presentations and to kind of really both inspiring us with what's possible and also just really nuts and bolts, like tangible things we can all think about and do. It's been really helpful. And um, I really enjoyed that, uh, that closing thought, you know, from Nikki and from Jess, I guess, a little as well in terms of like, the people we're talking about are human beings and we can make that human connection and that's going to go a really long way in terms of um, recognizing where people are coming from recognizing the job they've got to do and what they need and where where the common ground is and building from that place mm -hmm.